Does a tech startup really need venture capital to grow, scale, and succeed? Our guest will share his advice and insights so you can build your tech business without VC funding. Uh, you better go grab your Smarty Pants hats for this episode of the Startup Life Live Show. Here we go. Hello and welcome everyone to the Startup Life Live Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, startup champion to first time founders. And after raising a one, two, three, four businesses of my own, I now help newly minted business owners sleep through the night by giving them peace of mind. I call it Andy Licious Advice. It's hardcore startup business strategies delivered with high enthusiasm, inspiration, and joy, because come on, we got to have fun while we're building these businesses, right? Can't be all seriousness. We got to have fun and games. So I am thrilled that you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game while cheering on a fellow founder. And for those of you watching now or via the replay, I would be genuinely grateful for your support of the show by clicking the like button on the video wherever you're watching from. And if you are on YouTube, I would be so grateful for a subscribe and a click on that bell icon. Oh, delicious. Thank you so, so much. I'm very excited to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the world. I always, you know, I tend to get a decoder ring when I uh, talk to this guest because he just ups my game big time. And I know my IQ always goes up after a conversation with our guest today, Ethan Anthony. Let me tell you a little bit about Ethan, okay? I've got a little ah, logo here to share with you. Ethan is the founder and CEO of Crank Chart, a company using conversational AI and behavioral sciences to seamlessly keep decision makers lockstep with data professionals with the goal of using data to drive business success. And Okay, how much do you love this photo right here? I love it, I've got a heart on it too. <laughs> Ethan can be best described as a self-taught voracious reader and highly motivated problem solver. You know, he spent half of his adult life in the Far East, fully immersed in the Chinese culture and language. And hey, in this picture, we were judges at a local accelerator program, e for all with some other of our favorite people right there. I'm so excited to welcome to the show the one, the only, it's him, Ethan Anthony. <laughs> Hi, Ethan. Hi, Andy. As per usual, happy to be here. I'm always delighted to do these interviews and these shows with you. It's, it's, oh, it's thank flat. you. Thank you. I'm so happy to say that one of my favorite tech founders out here has a IoT thermometer. Okay, temperature sensing business. Okay, Kristen, you know the, the deal here, what we have to do on the Startup Life Live show, everybody. You need to post your business name and website so we can amplify you and your business. All right, so, so happy you tuned in. And I know I saw Mary over here. All right, Mary, same thing, yay. So thrilled you're here. Um, Anthony, of course, you know, I met him here in Boston. He was an expert at the monthly pitch event that I co-host with Andy Jack. And we developed a wonderful friendship over the years, even though he's now down in the heart of Manhattan. Um, I am so glad you're here today, Ethan, to share your stories and also to help founders understand that, sure, you know, we love venture capital and, and absolutely it's one pathway to profitability and sustainability, but it's not the only way. And there's a lot of mythologies around that. But before we dive into all the gems that I know you're going to be sharing today, I would love to learn more. Well, let's just say you refer to yourself as the Uber data geek and folks go to LinkedIn and just type in Uber Data Geek, and that is Ethan's URL. Ethan, can you please share the receipts for how you got to where you are today and why you can refer to yourself as the Uber Data Geek? Um, I think that 
the journey started a long time ago when I when I first went to the Far East and I was I guess I was on a mission self discovery. So long story short, through the struggles and through the learning and the different processes, I I really began to sort of kind of embrace the power of data. I've always been curious about it, but I really jumped into it. And it was the perfect sort of kind of add on to my like desire to solve big problems. So, you know, sort of kind of fast forward when I started uh, grad school, or right before I started grad school at Harvard, I was talking to some alumni friends and um, they graduated and I was about to go in and, you know, they started sort of kind of calling me that. And Uber, as in German, meaning ultimate, and yes, ultimate data geek, and um, yes, it kind of stuck. So I was like, okay. Well, Uber, Goat, you know, you're both <laughs> greatest of all time. And you know, I think it says something about your brain that the data is so important. We all know, folks, that data provides solutions. It's telling you the patterns. It's telling you where things are going. We need it in our business all the time. But Edson has gone you know, even deeper into using this on a behavioral way, whether it's behavioral psychology or behavioral economics, which I'm not going to pretend I really understand, but I could. <laughs> I mean, you could, I mean, it, it's simply behavioral economics is just the science of decision making. You got a lot of great guys, Daniel Kahneman, Richard Thaler et al. They spent a lot of time taking traditional economics and combining it with behavioral psychology to study how we make decisions. And in short, we make decisions based on emotion and we justify them with logic. And when you understand 90, that. Hmm? Yeah, 90% of our decisions yes. are based on emotion. Yes. Yes. But so we do in, love that 10% of data to back it up. Well, and when you understand that, then you can actually, you can, and, and that's what I do. I help business decision makers remove sort of kind of the emotion and go into the logic side of their brain and really harness the power of data. And we use conversational AI to do that. Yeah. And that's with your business crank chart. Yes. That's what crank chart does. Long story yeah. short. Yeah. And folks, especially founders, when we're so in love with our solution, sometimes we like to make up stories about it and then we don't make good decisions as founders. So you really have to watch that data and know that that data is going to yeah. tell you your heart may be going this way or your quote intuition yeah. may be going this way. But if you want to be profitable and sustainable, you better make decisions over here. So I really like that idea. Ethan. So yeah, we really, and Ethan and I talked about this ahead of time, folks. We, you know, we could go on forever about Ethan's background because it's so phenomenal and so interesting, but you can go listen to one of my podcasts from a few years ago when I interviewed him about all that. Today, we want to get right to the heart of this conversation and get going right into the fact that raising capital is really hard. And it requires a ton of effort, a ton of time, and can often take a founder's eye off the business. And after you get funding, then you find yourself spending hours communicating with investors, giving them the monthly updates. It can get really complicated. And frankly, 95% of businesses, as my understanding based on data, do just fine without this particular type of fundraising. So Ethan, let's talk about why you think companies can build a great tech startup without VC funding. Okay. Um, I like to start by saying this. When you think of any business at the conceptual stage, what is it? It's just an idea. All right. That idea is sort of kind of created by a person. Maybe a person saw a problem. Okay. You see a problem, you create an idea and you're passionate about it. Let's say you're excited about it. There's a massive psychology to starting a business. And I think that with the startup scene, if you will, a lot of that sort of kind of gets pulled. I mean, the, the, the true focus is pulled away. So you're out there watching, um, you know, like what these companies are doing, what that companies are doing. So everyone has a path to success. And I, I believe that when you look at businesses and you start to think about 
my business, my idea. If you take your eye off the problem and you start focusing on how everyone else is building their business, then that's when things go sideways. That's right. Um, that's right. It can be like a shiny object syndrome, yes. which we all have. I mean, it's yes. easy to go see what everybody else is doing because sometimes you're just so tired of looking at your own company. Yes. <laughs> and when you do that, you're going to be doing comparing and despairing and, and that's yes. no good either. Um, and, but you know, the, the folks that get amplified as are those who it becomes like this competition. Well, I raised 2 million. Yeah. Well, I raised 5 million. Well, yeah, I raised 50 million. Take that becomes this competition and celebration over how much you've raised versus yes. how are well, you yes. implementing and executing? Yes. Okay. So let's look at some, let's look at some data. Three out of four venture capital, you know, companies. We have three out of four companies that raise venture capital fail. And that's a fact. Um, and of that, okay, maybe less than I'd say five percent of the companies actually raise VC funds. So if you're fortunate enough to be one of the five percent, okay, who raise venture capital, all right, your chances of succeeding are about twenty five percent. Um. So when you really, look, but then. I think the bigger question is why? And the, the problem is like you were saying, there's this whole halo effect that we raise money, therefore we're gonna be successful and people forget about the problem and start hyper-focusing on appeasing VCs, chasing VC metrics, VC milestones, et cetera. No, don't get me wrong. We are not anti-VC, not by any stretch of the imagination. But I think the whole thesis of this, 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 this segment is, about how if you don't focus on solving the problem and get it right without external funding, you're not going to know what to do or how to drive your business with external funding. And believe it or not, the few companies you see that are out there that are massive successes, believe it or not, they figured it out before they got VC funding. So if you, if you need VC funding to figure it out, you're probably not doing the right things. That's well just it. But what can happen though, sometimes with the tech companies, you need the money to, to prove, you know, you, you can do a, maybe an MVP, um, but then you've got to do a beta in the market and you're trying to do it, how? Okay, so if we were talking in 2008, I think that this, what I'm about to say would be less possible, but now in 2021 with the democratization of everything, tech. I mean, the, the, the amount it costs you to build an MVP is substantially lower. Engineering talent that can help you build an MVP is, is more plentiful. The most important thing is this. I think that people have this false illusion about what they need in the way of an MVP. Okay. There's this belief that, okay, I'm going to build this software. I'm going to go solve this problem. I need to have version 10, this, this fancy, you know, like elaborate software system in order to be successful that is completely not true in fact you're more likely to fail if you do that the best approach would be to take a minimalist like sort of kind of uh strategy and say all right what do i absolutely need the bare bones the basics get the most basic version and get it in front of someone who's willing to try it someone who you identify as a customer and then you go from there and you iterate over changes this is a dirty work um, I've done uh, workshops on validating product validation, et cetera. And people sit there and they're in awe. They're like, well, you know, they don't want to wait for that. It's like, go slow in the beginning so you can go fast later. The illusion that you have to have money to do everything, with the exception of a few industries like biotech and automotive, et cetera, you don't need a lot of capital to get started. You can start right now. Think about it, Andy, to get a domain name to set up a landing page, to do surveys, to do all these things you need to validate what you're thinking about. They're, I mean, they're pennies to the dollar. So That's if you invest all your time and focus on validating, you're gonna discover a lot of interesting things. You're gonna realize that, first of all, some of the things you thought would work, won't work. Second of all, things that you thought wouldn't work, will work. And by the time you get to the point where you actually build something basic, guess what happens? 
it's going to be more likely to, let's say, hit and stick. And from there, you methodically go up. Uh, one other point I want to make is this. If you don't believe me, Google it, okay? There is a new wave of companies now, and they're not talked about because this doesn't benefit VCs at all. It's the bootstrapping companies. Companies are bootstrapping their way to millions of dollars a year in annual recurring revenue. It's normal, actually, but you won't hear about it because, well, there's no halo effect if you actually do the dirty work and you know get the company going and get everything set up, et cetera. But there's a growing number of companies. And if you read about it, you'll be inspired. There are companies that are starting with nothing, one or two co-founders. There are solo founder companies that are coming up getting 250, 300,000 a year in revenue. Solo founder. But what they did was they did the dirty work. They figured out the problem, they identified a problem, and they spent time validating. Now, these companies take six months to a year to get going. They're not going to be like over just a month or two, but still. Think about that for a second. You know, I'm sitting with it. I love it. And of course, you know, my favorite story is MailChimp. Day oh, one, yes. they bootstrapped the whole thing and it was wonderful. And never, you know, I think to this day, 100% ownership. The young yes. men, and as I always say, the founders of StreamYard, I have shoes older than they are. They, same thing, they built it up and, you know, they just over a two year period, they hung out for a year in beta. As in one of my favorite stories is every Sunday night to this day at 6 p.m. PT, 9 a.m. EST, they have a 30 minute live with their people, with their customers. Here's yes. what we're doing. What are your ideas? What's going on? Yes. They just sold to hop in for 250 million. Acquired, you, they're acquired by for, for two hundred fifty million. Can do this like with cloud computing, Amazon Web Services. You pay per usage. Google, um, Google Cloud Platform is giving this stuff away just to get more users. The, the point is, all you have to be patient enough to do your homework. The opportunities are there, but what you have to do is first of all make sure you're solving a real problem. Validate that problem. Make sure that you've identified. Your, your target customer, make sure you have TAM, make sure your total accessible market is, is, is there. Once you have those things, take your time. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Just take your time. Because this illusion that you gotta grow, 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 hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, scale, 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 scale. The, the, the whole, the, the Reed Hoffman thing, first of all, that's reserved for a small subset of companies. And to be honest with you, there's no disrespect to these companies. They're really not solving any real problems. They're basically derivative solutions with a, with a slight twist, maybe a social you know, app or what have you. It's slightly different from the next. So yes, they have to have a lot of venture funding to take advantage of the hype cycle. They have to have a lot of venture funding to sort of kind of race past any would-be competitors. But right. if, you're, if you've actually identified a problem, say, well, I want to create a system that uses, say, proximity to help oh, I don't know, um, the visually impaired. And you are, you have domain knowledge in that area and domain knowledge, we'll come back to that, is very important when you want to start something. If you don't have it, you need to have somebody on your team who's got domain knowledge of the target area. But if you know this, work on that. Focus on that. You can build a multi-billion dollar business just by going one step at a time because there will be a time to speed up, but it's not in the beginning. Awesome. And I, you know, Yes, Kirsten, you guys have done a phenomenal job. It's called Blue Maestro, and it is this disc that does incredible uh, temperature sensing, whether it's in a pacifier for your baby or you're in outer space. It has a lot of functionality, and you have done year after year staying focused, improving, iterating, amazing. And folks, you know, when I always say, throw up your business with the URL and what you're doing. This is what I'm talking about. Here's Zaze, mission to produce the world's finest early harvest, cold pressed extra virgin olive oil by the hands of strong and diverse women around the world. Okay, socially responsible company. And yes, you have from the beginning, uh, Lauren, uh, worked, Laura worked really hard in your bootstrapping. And yes, it does hurt sometimes. And there are sacrifices. And you know, I wrote, I did a video 
um, you know, VC, Angel, or bootstrapping you? Know, which oxygen do you want? And it was because I was listening to Reed Hoffman interviewing the MailChimp founder, Ben, and he was like, oh, you could have been much further along and scale, 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 and all of this. And then the next podcast that came up was Gary V talking about bootstrap, baby. It's the only way to go. And I'm fond of the bootstrap method because you work out a lot of kinks. You heard as in say initially that a lot of times your product is not ready for market as it is. So why, you know, think you're going to bring something perfect to market. And that's, I'm going to bring up a uh, media prepared founder, Eric Cox's question on your take on Quibi's failure with 1.8 billion in investment, Eric. It um, was it, it, you, when you see these, th this is what I'm, this, this is, this is to drive home our point, Andy, this is what I'm talking about. All right. So all you guys out there bootstrapping, keep doing what you're doing. All right. VC funds, angel funds, they're not going anywhere. But if you bootstrap and let's say you get yourself to a quarter of a million, half a million, a million or 2 million or 10 million or 20 million a year in revenue, you can look out at investors and say, okay, do I want to deal with VCs? You have the option. Optionality, as, as, as Nassim Tlaib says, is what you want. You want optionality. And by bootstrapping, you have maximum optionality. So you can go either path. When you look at these creepy, these companies like that, I mean, there are tons of them in the graveyard. Again, one out of four succeed, the other three fail. And believe it or not, it doesn't matter. There's no correlation with success in terms of how much VC funding you raise. Okay? Quibi was hyped up. I mean, their model in theory was good. It really was. You had short these short 10-minute movies, basically. And All quality. Right? Really good yes. quality. Yes. But here's the problem with that. Had they started small and tested it, they would have realized that the biggest problem they would have had was content. Okay. And then they would have been working on content providers. And one idea could have been like, why don't we work with independent studios and aggregate and crowdsource our content? You know what I mean? And then we provide them with the, the, the high level support and studios, etc. We have a vetting process. They, the content would have been out the roof. And guess what? They still be around. But VCs aren't going to fund that. Okay, unless it's already successful. But what they will do is say, we have all these seasoned executives, they're backed by this group, etc. Let's put a bunch of money. Think about this for a second, guys. A billion dollars and they still couldn't make it work. A billion dollars and they still couldn't make it work. Now that ought to get you excited if you're bootstrapping. <laughs> because because you can make it work on a dollar. Because that's you know. right. That's right. And I, you know, and I really admire our good friend, Sad, who was on the show a few weeks ago, introducing us to Maya. And um, yes, and Sad, you and I were talking about this too on Twitter, the importance of keeping ownership. Hey, right? Sad, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> keeping ownership. You, know, you, you, you bring in the big money. You might feel like a million bucks because you raised a million bucks. But now what does your runway look like? And that's the other thing I want to talk about. When you're bootstrapping, you have a lot longer runway. You have the ability to move and flexibility. When you get that VC money in, this is it. They're, they want, we, well, let's talk about what the VC agenda is so people can understand. Yeah. And by the way, when Ethan just said earlier, you know, that three to four, three, three out of four fail, that's three out of four VC backed businesses fail. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, the VC agenda is simple. They want an exit. VCs have limited partners and their limited partners are the people who give them money and they need to make a return on that investment. VCs aren't waiting for you to figure out a way to be frugal with their money. You get no loan from a VC if you're good with money. They want you to burn through it, hence the burn rate. You know why? Because the more money you spend, the better you can make that company look by bringing on high profile executives, by having a nice office, by having the best environment to work in and all that stuff. It says nothing about your model, it says nothing about productivity, it says nothing about advancement, it says everything about the packaging. Why? Because if that company is properly packaged and you hit one or two metrics of key milestones set by the VC, of course, then they can sell you, okay? It's hot potatoes. And that's essentially what happens. That's the, the, the VC agenda. And when you look at it from a startup perspective, you should be really nervous 
about receiving money from a VC because even when you get this money, this halo effect, you know, do the press release thing, what you're buying is a bunch of egos. When you go out there and say, we have a hundred million dollars, we're hiring now, what are you gonna get? What, what, type of, what type of talent are you gonna get? When you got Google and Amazon and Apple, they have way more money, Microsoft. So what, what are you gonna get, you know? So it's just, when you bootstrap and take your time, you see everything, you learn. That's right. And folks, I, you may recall back in December, we had Alyssa Cohn on and Alyssa talked about how when you bring it on your talent initially and you're bootstrapping, you have this agreement with the folks who are joining you at this initial stage that you promise that when you are scaling to that much larger point that you will hire someone that they will love working with and learn yes. from. Because as bootstrap, uh, talent acquisition, is a different strategy than scaling into the stratosphere uh, for your talent acquisition. Uh, Ethan, can we just say hi to our good friend here? Hi, Andy. Andy, what's going on, dude? <laughs> and he says, great talk so far. Greetings from the West Coast. Ethan rocks. So everybody, you, you saw this photo I put up initially, right? The guy on this side here, that's Andy Jack my co-host for Founders Live Boston pitch event. And uh, I just wanted to bring that up, AJ. So good to see you. I know you're hanging out down in Palm Springs, enjoying the warm weather, missing all this cold snow here in the Northeast. Oh, um, yeah. AJ has a really good point. This convo is so important. Many times, first time, first time founders immediately resort to and glamorize the blitz scaling via raising money first, and then proving the concept second. It, has to be reversed, AJ. Yes. Agree a hundred percent on that. Yes. Great, great comment. Um, and, and let's explore that a little because there is a glamorizing. Yeah, you know, we AJ and I, we have our co-host this co-host this monthly pitch event, folks, because I'm a firm believer, I know AJ is too. This is how you meet people, how you open doors. You know, we get a chance to add wind to the sales, make connections for the founder, introduce them to some talent they need. Maybe there's an angel investor that might throw 50K, 150K in just to give them that little bit of a lift, a little bit of a some comfort. But more importantly, founders, you wanna do pitch events because it helps get free advice from really great judges yeah. and investors who will pick your business apart. Sometimes you'll throw it into the trash. Sometimes you'll keep it, but it's free. It's just your time getting up there and it helps you articulate your business. And you'll um, folks will see some holes and give you some great feedback. You can go yay and run back home. So be sure to apply to Founders Live Boston, everyone. <laughs> anyway, to pitch and just, you know, keep pitching everywhere you're glowing because it's great feedback. It doesn't, you don't have to be, you know, getting the money, but AJ is right. There's this glamorization. We see it all the time. We see it in the movies. We see it online about the fundraising. And as an, I don't, you know, I know you're not on Twitter, but there is a huge explosion of everybody becoming a VC now. Uh, yeah, you and I talked about this in one of our just um, personal conversations about how I mentioned that there's such a low bar to become a VC. First of all, most people who say they are VC, if they're not coming from Greylock or one of the one of the big guys, don't take them seriously, because because you know people call themselves VCs and there are actually specific rules and definitions for VC. Do they have limited partners? Are they organized per IRS standards and tax codes as a VC, as a venture fund? You know, these are the things you need to do if you're going to vet a VC. By all means, do your due diligence, but. Yeah, the reason why everyone says that they're a VC because I mean there there are they might be a VC, but they're not a venture capitalist, they're vulture capitalists. Okay. Right. Their okay. their their goal is to exploit and take advantage of all of the, the, the great minds out there who are looking to innovate, but who are naive in, in into thinking that or who are naive and believe that in order to be successful, they need VC funding. Now, here's 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 what I say. Here's a great formula, great formula. If you have an idea and you strongly believe in it and you think this is going to be great and in your mind you think you need vc funding for it pause take a month talk to people about it get the hard and like andy said go to these like founders lives and, and go to these pitch contests 
get it out there and vet it, okay? What you're gonna find is really amazing. Remove the VC from the equation and ask yourself, can I get one single customer? Don't think about two, don't think about three, don't think about five, just one customer. Okay. And think about that, folks, because the time that it's taking you to polish off your pitch deck, maybe paying someone to make it look pretty, doing all this stuff. If you took that energy and focused on getting one more customer. One. Yeah. And imagine this, if you bootstrap your company, let's say um, like the, the, the guys who provide the streaming service we're doing right now, streaming yard, let's say if you bootstrap your company, all right, and you sold it for 250 million. You know how much money you get from that sale? Okay. You and your co-founder basically get to walk away with all of it. With the exception, let's say maybe you had some angel investors in, involved. Some family but and friends. Some family and friends, money. yes. But but most of that money is yours. But if you then were to take a bunch of money, VC money, et cetera, and you sell it for 250, you'd be lucky if you and your co-founder get to split like 30 million. You're lucky. Like really lucky really lucky it'd be a lot lower than that yes it would be yes it would be yeah. P particularly because you're taking money and this is an important point when you go out and you think vc first you're also diluting the heck out of yourself so you're not getting anything you're basically giving your company away and thinking that because you have money your chance of succeeding is higher but in actuality your chance of succeeding are lower plus your percentage of ownership is less wow <laughs> <laughs> What a combo. <laughs> and folks, just, you know, you see Shark Tank, you know, was it 10 years now, 11 years now, you're seeing the deals, you're seeing all this go down, you see how much money, how much ownership they want for their 250k. Yep. And that's why you see owners walk away from that. Yep. Um, and because and a lot of times, after the show, when they sit down uh, with the sharks and start negotiating and the attorneys get involved, yeah, the deal often goes doesn't go through. Um, as in, I'm just going to throw this up real quickly, folks. Go to this link if you want to download. It's my. It's not just my in questions that you can expect from investors, which are, by the way, really great questions just to be asking yourself about your business. Period. I also have a list of questions here that you want to ask investors, and it's it's very very clear questions to understand how they invest. Okay. You know, you do that for the pediatrician for your baby or the vet for your puppy. Okay. It's the same thing. You're, you're going to be marrying these people if you go to raise money, but we're talking about bootstrapping here. And you know, sometimes that means you have a great idea. You mean, you may need to work somewhere and do it as a side hustle. You may need to downsize where you're living and downsize your needs. And that's okay to make that sacrifice because you're bringing an incredible product to the world. We all want what you have. You know, sure, maybe it's been done before, but not by you and not for us. Exactly. And it requires that level of sacrifice and hard work and making decisions to not play or spend the way you may have been used to and it may mean taking a, a job to capitalize your business. What are your um, thoughts about that, Ethan? I agree with you 100%. But what I think, uh, I, it, adding to your point, what I think scares the heck out of people is a lot of the people who want to start companies, they're not technical. Um, as an engineer, and then technical people have another set of problems. But let's, let's start with the non-technical people. You're a non-technical co-founder, a non-technical founder. And the first thing they tell you is you need to go find a technical co-founder. Okay, that's synonymous with walking in a bar with a wedding. I mean, it's it's just not, you know, it's it doesn't make sense. I mean, like finding a co-founder is really hard. I mean, if you guys don't really originate the idea together, the chance of you find someone to come along, like really come along at the bottom is is very small. It can happen, but I I don't suggest you go around looking for it because that's just that's like matchmaking. But right. the, the key thing is if you are a non-technical founder, the challenge you look at is the technology. And it amazes me how many non-technical founders don't even realize how straightforward the tech is today in 2021 and how people mislead them into thinking that tech is this very impossible thing when it's not. It really isn't. So what I want to do and what 
it, it's gonna be like a side project. I'm springing this on you, but uh, we are going to work together and um, sort of kind of construct a framework. And then I'll just, it'll be, you know, like Andy's like, it's sort of kind of a snap on to help you guys out there who want to bootstrap you non-technical founders. So for example, like in software engineering, a requirements document, we come up with a sample requirements document and then Andy would have the template for it. So you can look at it, all right? And then you'll be able to say, all right, this is what I need. And it's okay, fine. You fill out the requirements document to the best of your ability. And then what else? Now you need an engineer. So you go to different services and you hire an engineer, pay them, I don't know, whatever, an hour to help you build a design document. Right. See, so you're not paying them full time on staff, whatever, but yep. you're paying an engineer to help you build a design document. Now, what does that mean? When you have a design document in hand, you can then go around and find out who can build this for you the best way. You can get better deals because what outsourcing companies charge you for is ignorance. Yeah. When you, I was talking to uh, uh, several outsourcing companies like about three weeks ago, good ones, great ones. These guys were talking about upwards $50,000 because they assumed I didn't know what I was talking about. But then when I said, okay, well, look, I have a requirement document here. Okay, this is the design document. This is the exact flow. This is what I'm looking for. This is that. No, these are the non-functional requirements. These are the functional right. requirements. And so, so tell me, how do you get to 50K given this is the design? Exactly. Well, and what they do is they start stacking on stuff like, well, we can provide you a service where we validate the users for you. We can provide you with a service where we help you to discover the problem. When you've done all that and you come to them with a design document, it's just okay, let's work together to put this design together. And then you offer your advice based on that design. The price went all the way down to like 15,000. Yeah. Okay. And it could have been less than that, but this is one of the better ones. So what we want to do is we have a framework that takes the scare out of the technical part so that people will know, okay, once you have this requirements document, you hire an engineer, you can get an engineer, pay them by the hour, get them to build a design document. Design document is universal. Now you can speak engineer. That's right. And folks, oh, I, and you probably know Igor Belogoretsky. Last April, I interviewed him. I, you know, I'll put in the show notes the link to his How to Not Spend a Fortune on Product Development link. Exactly. It's a nice, it's a wonderful slideshow, folks. Takes you right through it so that you ask those right questions that Ethan is talking about today. I love that. And, you know, and that mythology that you need to go get a, go get a tech co founder. Be careful of that, folks. Really, you know, at the end of the day, you got a great tech founder, but you, you still can't get to profitability or sustainability exactly. because execution, implementation, understand your customer segment, the distribution channels to get to that customer segment all come from the leader. That's you. Yes. And, uh, and again, that's why I appreciate people tuning into the Startup Life Live show because you up your game as a founder. And hey, Serge at X3EM, looking for a great chief robotics officer for our moonshot to help and solve housing affordability crisis. Wow, that's a lofty goal. <laughs> but you know, I'm willing to amplify that ask right out there, Serge. Good for you. Absolutely. You can get out there. And hey, Aristotle, so good to see you. Aristotle has a very lofty goal. I hope you're taking this in about the co-founder of the tech. He's got a cryptocurrency. See, um, Bitcoin platform that he feels really strongly about, but he's working and he will bootstrap it and make that happen. Thanks for tuning in, Aristotle. So, you know, we were talking about the funds and the agendas, but there is still a bit of that Kool Aid out there led by startup communities such as Boston and New York and San Francisco, LA. Um, you know, what, how, how can we help founders sort of shift their focus off of, I've got to raise money. I've got to raise money. I've got to raise money. You know what? I mean, that's my biggest goal right now. What founders need to see is they need to see a company, a founder succeed on the big scale, massively succeed. And with the big story being, you know what? The VC funding just wasn't in play. They need to see that. I think the more stories like that they see, the more people will realize that, I'll tell you guys a secret. And, and it's not really a secret when you really look at the numbers. 
your chances for success if you bootstrap are astronomically higher yeah. because you control your own fate. You know, you control your own fate. And when you remove the allure of go fast, go fast, go fast, the VCs lose all their steam. If you say, I'm going to take this year and I'm going to take my time, guess what happens? You remove the whole VC funding from your thing. You start focusing on getting it right. You start going, you adopt the bootstrap mindset. People who are bootstrapping, and guys, if I'm wrong out there, audience, please tell me I'm wrong. But people who are bootstrapping, you're not thinking about going a thousand miles an hour. You're thinking about getting it right right now, getting to the next one, getting it right. Small wins, the proliferation. Yes. That's the focus. When you do that, things will speed up at some point. And when they do, you'll have a roadmap, directional coordinates. But the 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 Reed Hoffman's of the world, again, I have no problem with Reed. I, I, I think I think he's a smart guy, but they sell people on this notion that if you don't, first of all, the definition of growth is skewed. Growth right. is like the scale and hyper growth. You got to go on LinkedIn and say, we're hiring 100 people. Now, how are you going to get a well-aligned organization <laughs> with good communication if you announce on LinkedIn that you are hiring 100 people because you just raised, I don't know, $20 million? So we have the perfect example of this going on before our eyes right now, everybody. And it's that wonderful new platform, Clubhouse, right? Where you had to have the secret handshake and uh, you know get the secret number to get in and and all, but we you have to understand if you go on TechCrunch, you're going to understand why there is such huge hype and why they created this exclusive place to build the millions of millions of users, and they got their money from Andreessen Horowitz and a few others back in May 2020. Nice chunk of change, 10 million. They got another undisclosed amount from a couple of other big VC firms in July. And what they launched a few minutes before May 2020. And so they, maybe not, maybe they had launched a little sooner. And now they've just got another big tranche of money with a valuation of a billion dollars. This is the Reed Hoffman way of building a business. Get the hype up there, get everybody going, make it exclusive, make it a scarcity so that people glop on to this community. And every, you know, everyone's having a good time. Great things are happening. It's wonderful. But this is the example. These two founders, um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. You talk about it. Ethan? Um, well, I'm a San Francisco guy, see it all the time. And um, this is why the bootstrapping companies will be will will will, will change the game. But they your your typical founder makeup, two white guys, um, and what they're doing is 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 very smart. They're banking on the fact that they know that they're not going to be able to grow a social business, a social app to like a hundred billion dollars. Ain't going to happen. But what will happen is Facebook, Google, and 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 Microsoft will get into a bidding war. And they, they're looking at maybe a five or ten billion dollar acquisition in record time. That's what they're gonna go for. That's the reason why all those top VCs are getting in, because guess what? VCs want, they want an exit. And that company's being built as an exit. That's why they're taking these massive rounds early. The, the founders are getting diluted out, but they don't care. They can go down to like three percent ownership if the company goes for like eight billion. They don't care. Um, it's a strategy, a guys. It's That's a, a great return. But also remember that as a user, folks, yeah, because sometimes, you know, you're being used as a user <laughs> to create value. And, you know, one of my little bit of a pet peeve around the whole clubhouse thing is that it's a couple of white guys leveraging their relationships in yep. Silicon Valley yep. on the backs of the diverse community that they've worked really hard to bring onto the platform. Again, having a great time. They're going to do everything right. And it's going to be a wonderful case study for folks. And there's nothing wrong in that type of trajectory. But for the 95% of the other founders out there, this is not your role model. This is not the star you should be building on. What should they be building toward? You, I like the example of MailChimp. Um, but there are other companies out there, and I forget the name of the URL, we'll find it. But I mean, there are, I want people to look at this site because 
you see on their weekly where they publish all these bootstrap SaaS companies that are doing a million, two million, 20 million in revenue that you never heard of. You never heard of them, which tells you one thing. If this same company was VC back and they were making 20 million in revenue, everybody and their mother would hear about them. Like they'd be like, oh my God, they're a three year old company and making 20 million in revenue. They got all this VC funding, they're on their way. But a bootstrap company, no love. They have to go through independent like media sources to get to get because pu- nobody picks them up. TechCrunch is not gonna pick them up. No. Unless they get acquired. No one cares. You could make a half billion dollars as a bootstrap company in revenue and nobody will talk about you. Guys, guess what? Not to go deep into Sun Tzu, but that's perfect. Because the one thing that kills these startups, to go back to your original point, um, Andy, about the 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 hype and 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 how people get dragged into a drink in the kool-aid it's the fact that the media this desire to be a media star when you remove that component and you focus on customers look you want to be a star in your circle of customers if you're a star in your circle of customers you don't give a damn if no one else knows about you your name could be whatever um so these you there is a growing number of there are a growing number of, 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 of bootstrap companies, SaaS companies in particular, that are making a crap ton of money that you never, ever heard about. And if you see companies, you'll be super inspired because you're like, hold on one second, read their stories. And like these two founders, they sat around, they did it, and da, da, da. or like, um, oh my God, there, there, there are tons like yeah. Airtable, so- Airtable was bootstrapped. Love oh, Airtable. Yeah, Airtable. Like Airtable I have a hard- bootstrapped a long time. Yep, they're amazing, everybody. Go check them out. Um, is it is it get LATKA.com list of top bootstrap SaaS companies? Is that it? Or I, is I it... think that's yes, 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 yes. That okay, is. so let me yes. That guy okay. has written me, um, Nathan, he's written me several times and we go back and forth occasionally. But I mean, they do a great job of like aggregating. Awesome. I'm going to go put this into the comment threads, folks, and I'm also going to put it in a banner and put it right up here so those watching can see this as well. Um, And let me just show this banner. That's the link, everybody, and I'll have it in the show notes, too, um, so you can go and see. And, you know, this is one of the reasons I have this show, Ethan, is because I want representation here. Whether you're trying to change your life generationally with your business or the serve the community with your business, go regional, national, global, whatever it is, you know, representation matters. And 95% of businesses are figuring it out by building their customer base and using that money, lines of credit, maybe something from the 401k or from family and friends to make it happen. So AJ has a a great question here. Let me just go grab it. For founders out there like me who are currently focused on the intersection of value and profitability, do customers have to pay for your product in order to achieve proof of concept? There are many different schools of thought on this. In my estimation, in the beginning, no. From what I've seen, what works is this. In the very beginning, you reward those early customers by not having them pay because the value of what they're giving you in a way of feedback far exceeds anything you can get in a way of money. But once you refine it in the next wave, you charge, but you charge at a discounted rate again, because you're still getting that early stage validation. But as you move forward, once you get feedback from your customers, you're also engaging in, in price optimization. So you're figuring out what the optimal price might be. As long as you are aware of what the price should be and you're getting proper feedback and iterating over product, okay, it's okay in the beginning to give those customers free or discounted like product. I don't have a problem with that. People say you should charge for everything, charge for everything. It's a crappy product, still charge for it. I don't agree with that because I believe that in the beginning, what you want is you want to create that tight relationship. And it's not to say that free is always good, but in this particular case, it's like, look, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Right. Okay. Well, and you could develop a level of intimacy with your customers that you wouldn't otherwise get. Also look at it as the rock star business marketing methodology, which is you get the 5% of fans who helped you launch, build and grow 
StreamYard did this. They reached yep. out to all of us who had been on Google Hangouts and on Blab and said, can you help us out? Can you test this out for us? Yep. And took our feedback. And it was wonderful. But you get then a brand ambassadors that you would have had, you'd have to pay a fortune in marketing to get by yep. giving them it, giving this product initially for free. AJ, thank you so much for that. Great question. Um, Marianne B, do you have any ideas about how to use Google AdSense to your advantage? What do you think of the advertising model to jumpstart or sustain your website? Using Google AdSense is important. It, 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 it is a helpful tool, but here's what I learned that, that was really, really important. My initial thought on Google AdSense back in the day was that, well, if I take like, oh, I don't know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, I could just put it on there and I could just advertise my way to success. No, as is the case with everything else in the bootstrapping world, it's all about experimentation, guys. If you take nothing else away, remember that word, experimentation. So the best way to use Google AdSense is to take $50, okay, $100 max and run test ads, all right? That's sufficient for you to get, you know, sort of feedback to what works and what doesn't work. Find out what works first. And then when you find out something that works, then you boost it up to a couple hundred dollars. And if you still get the same results, you keep going and you keep going and you keep going, but you take your time. It's not so much using Google Ads that matters, it's using Google Ads the right way. And the only way you can figure it out, anybody, the largest companies, all of them, the only way they figure it out is by running tests. And these tests are cheap cheap experiments to figure out what works. You could do A-B testing through the way. I mean, there's so many different models you can do, uh, but less money, more um, And I th I think uh, Eric's question, well, what it's very difficult to go back and charge after they've had it for free. Sometimes you can put them into like a grandmother uh, phase where you say, okay, you know, you're gonna have this period and then we're going to start charging you. What are your well, thoughts? Well, there are a lot of SaaS companies that actually do that. Um, because at one point or another, it was like, everything's free. And it was like, no, you can't be free. And then it was like, okay, well, we do a tiered approach and then get people to go up, up, up. And that actually, that model actually works. And your point is correct, Andy. What happens is this, if I have customers and they're free customers and they were free, all right, and they're still free, I create, okay, I grandfather them in and say, okay, they're free, leave them alone. But here's where data comes in. These free customers, if they're using the product a lot, if they don't, they don't count. They're gonna churn. I mean, they count, but they're gonna churn. But if they are using the product a lot, then it is your responsibility to use the data and upsell them. You know, there are different ways just to nudge people to upgrade but you have to read the data. Let's say if somebody's using, the best thing you can have is a free customer who's using the heck out of your product because now you can figure out what they like and take that data and you build on it. And a lot of SaaS companies have been very successful at that. That's why onboarding and, and, and these extended marketing campaigns are very, very, very important. It's, you know, dialogue. Right, right. So folks, you know, we start off this conversation saying that do you really need VC money to scale your business to reach profitability and have success? And Ethan has gone deep into why you don't need to and the numbers, meaning that really it's a small percentage that actually get the VC money, even though, I mean, my gosh, if you and if you're on Clubhouse or if you're on Twitter, you know, Every time you're turning around, it's VC this, VC that, person with a VC after their name, VC City. It really can be what Essence said at the beginning. Do the hard work now, make the sacrifices now, position, work out the kinks so that when you do want to scale, you're going to scale in your terms and at your pace, not at a predefined runway based on an agenda. I mean... We hear this all the time. In fact, I'm always wondering, where's all that money going? These VCs, oh, we just closed on a $100 million fund. Yay, us, VC fund. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how are you going to find the companies that are going to give you that return, VC fund? Who's getting it? must be the life sciences or the biosciences or you know, the hard asset companies, SN, because I just, I don't know. They almost celebrate their achievement too. But nothing has changed since I raised 
money for my first customer back in 1992. Everybody remember Aerobet? I helped raise money for him so he could launch that in a bootstrapped way. But we were looking at VC money initially. Nothing has changed since then. Three out of the four that they're investing in are going to fail. They are counting on that one that's going to give them a lift and create yes. more wealth down the road. Yes. Yeah. So basically, if you're a portfolio company with a VC and you're not that star company, you're just a number. And you're either going to, they're either going to pull out or they're going to force you to for a for sale, anything. The bottom line is VCs want to get their money back. Yeah. Um, and the psychology of dealing with VCs, I'll conclude by just simply saying it. Your chances for success are astronomically higher if you bootstrap because you have increased optionality, maximum optionality. VCs, you can still explore. Angels, you can still explore. But then it's better to explore angels and VCs when you know your directional coordinates and you have mastered what you want to do. Okay, that's a mindset hack. And by the way, folks, I'm going to stitch that on a pillow. <laughs> you're going to have much more success when you're, your chances of success are exponentially higher when you bootstrap. Yes. And yeah. uh, and and women, you know, female founders, BIPOC founders. I mean, you're already it's already an uphill battle, right? Because of pattern matching. So you know, you can find a way to bootstrap until some of that stuff gets worked out. It's not on your shoulders to work that out. It's on the investor's shoulders to work that out. Um, I've had founders, Ethan, go to reg or equity crowdfunding. What are your thoughts about that as a way for? funding a product to help get it launched. You know, everybody will get a, a piece of the action, so to speak, on the product or a little piece of the action will be put into a, oops, into an LP. <laughs> what are your I, thoughts on that? I like it. I, I think it's a potential funding source. I think it's still relatively new. And mm -hmm. I think that people are still worried or concerned about, you know, like for example, equity splits and who gets what and that kind of yeah. stuff. But again, the good thing about those funding sources is that they help you to validate your product. Okay. It's not like you're going to, you know, a bunch of suits saying, let me tell you what I'm doing and have them, That's you know, right. what have you. You're um, still in charge yes, when you're, you're doing reg yes. or equity crowdfunding folks, yes. you still have to pull yes. together the proper documents. It has to be yes. under the umbrella. That's all SEC approved, yes. Yes. but some people have had great success and you're right. They get to prove the product. So it's a wonderful way to glow. Ethan, this has been such a great conversation. You've helped so many people. How, you know, you've been at this uh, for years as a founder, solo founder, um, team founder, what has, I should say, how has this founder journey served you, both personally and professionally? What words of wisdom can you share with folks out there who are bootstrapping from your experience as a founder? Um, I guess it would come down to love and passion. If you do what you love and, and you're passionate about it, and I know it sounds cliche, but you're going to that's going to give you the, the juice to go the extra mile or to when everything else is sort of kind of falling apart. Um, my journey as a founder started when I was in the Far East and it was tough. And I kept going and what helped me was I focused on the problem, solving massive problems at internet scale. That's always been my thing and it's always going to be my thing. And you'll hear about me one day sooner than later. Um, that's because I've been at it. But as a founder, you just gotta, you have to live in your own bubble. Now we talk about isolation and how isolation is not good, but there's another side where isolation is good in the sense that you have to be able to block out the noise. So I told you about this, how I have social media blockouts. Like I don't, yeah. I just, I just, I generally try to avoid it because there's this halo effect where if I sit there and I read about all these companies get funded, it will creep into my head. And I know it's wrong, but it'll creep into my head. But that's what the media, that's what they're good at. That's that's their level of expertise. So personally, for me, it's been challenging, but I mean, it's been the most excitement and fun I've ever had because I get to make my own destiny. Right. And for me, that's the most important thing. Professionally, it's been really weird. Um, as a as a Black American, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've been shunned by VCs. I've been told by people that I'm not intelligent. I don't have the takes or I don't have the look or any of that other stuff. I wasn't aware that there was a look, but there is a look apparently. Um, I don't have anything, you know, I don't have it, that it factor. And I was told that in the Far East and I told that here in America. And at one point, it really, really, really got me to a state of depression because I really believed that I just wasn't meant to be successful and that I had to look like Zuck or, or Jeff Bezos to really be successful at on a, on, a, on a big stage. But then, you know, a professor of mine over on campus at Harvard, he threw cold water on that. And from that point on, I never looked back. And I was like, you know what? Why not me? And whenever you're struggling as a founder and you don't look the part, as they say, or people reject you and say, well, you don't have what it takes or this is stupid, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Keep going. Even if you're wrong, keep learning and you'll get it right. Just follow your path and you'll get there and you'll be a happier person for it. I love that something fierce. Thank you so much. I'm going to pull up your logo again. Who should reach out to you? Who's your customer base? Um, well, my focus is on decision makers who want to better use data. So basically, in two seconds, I'll say this. Today, we have the biggest problem, the major problem. That they've spent a lot of money on analytics tools. They have all these data scientists, but companies still can't make decisions with data because the decision makers don't know how to communicate with the data people. What we do is we help decision makers communicate with data people on our platform. That's it. We use a structured process to help decision makers talk to data people, know what's going on, 360 degree view of your analytics. That's it. Excellent. Excellent. We're on that. One last comment. In these days, getting funded is viewed as a successful startup, but how does a bootstrap startup who is not looking for investments define the metrics for being successful startup? Mm, That's straightforward. (laughs) First of (laughs) all, you have to actually one at a time. Success is one at a time. One customer. For me, this is success. If you want to talk about like the numbers, one customer, five customers, 10 customers, 20 customers, 40 customers. You see where this is going? Okay. So if you can't get one customer, you're not successful. And after that, guys, look, listen, everybody's uniquely different. We look out and we we want some magic formula. We want an anecdote. Fact of the matter is you have to define success. You have to define success. So if your business is doing X, Okay, you can look at industry standards, you can look at this, you can look at, but at the end of the day, you have to define success. And whatever it is, you'll hit it. My goal for Crank Chart, success for me is 500 million in ARR. That's my goal. I want to reach 500 million in annual recurring revenue. That's what I want. Um, and, and we're going to get it. Uh, oh, yeah. It's going to be well, a, a bit problem of a problem, but we're going to get it. Yeah, we're going to get it. And, so, and that's so important what Essen just shared with you all. Define what success looks like for you. I'm very clear about what success looks like for me. And um, nobody can steer me from that. I'm okay. And if they want to judge me, that's their choice. Same yeah. thing has to be for you because this is this is a business that as a founder, you a lot of heart has to be put into your business. So you have to do what's right for you. And that's why the self-awareness is so important. Oh my gosh, Ethan, I, you know... Thank you. Thank you for coming on board and talking about such an important topic from your place of authority as the Uber data geek, but also your deep understanding and confidence and experience. And you have the data to show it. Bootstrapping is a terrific way to build your business, to launch your business. You can do it on the lowdown, meaning yeah. you don't have to waste a lot of time or money. There are great tips and tools out there and resources to help you do that. And founders, as as Ethan said and shared so well that I'm going to stitch on a pillow, bootstraps, <laughs> bootstrap businesses have an exponentially higher chance of success. And a lot of times it's because they get plenty of room to make the, those mistakes. Yes have those experiments that Ethan was talking about and a runway for as long as they need, because 
right? Exactly. Yeah, and 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 my hope is to, like I said, I want to contribute and 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 get those uh, the documents out there because for the non technical founders, non technical founders really struggle because they look at tech as something that's like this object, but it's not that. It's not that complicated. A few documents, and then you're on your way. You just have yeah. to be able to speak the language. So stay in touch, folks, because Ethan will pull that together. Plus, remember in the show notes, I've got Igor Belogorodsky's wonderful link to his slide deck and how you can get a really good MVP and reiterate it again and again without spending a fortune and in a way that you are not being taken because you're not a CTO, you're not a tech founder. You can still bootstrap as a tech founder. That's another thing I'm taking away from today, Ethan. Thank you for that. You can launch and grow your tech company. <sighs> can I just say how good it is to see you <laughs> and spend this time with you? Lots of folks saying thank you and, you know, for your kindness. Um, Aristotle, I know. There you are. Oh, yeah. And here, God bless this man. Thank you. We got this. Absolutely. And one of my favorite live hosts right here. Hi, Mia Voss. Thanks for swinging by. Yes, it is a very valuable conversation. Anytime someone can chat with this deliciousness right here, Ethan Anthony, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm wicked smarter now, as we say here in Boston. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to you know, switch the banners here because I am my own producer, everybody, and take a moment to say goodbye to you all. Thank you so much, Ethan. I'll see you back in the green room in just one second. And to all the viewers, wow, right? Aren't you feeling better about your business, knowing that you're not having to run around and raise money and play this game? I still encourage you to pitch, okay? Because look, it's free advice from investors. <laughs> and they're gonna scrutinize and they're gonna look for those holes and they're gonna punch, you know, put the needle into your balloon. You might get a little deflated afterwards, but take a hard look at your business, get that great information. It's gonna help you know your business even better and up your game. So I'm truly grateful that you tuned in to carve up to, and carved out time for your business, for your founder mindset, for your ability to grow and scale your business. If you have any questions for Ethan or me, pop them into the comment threads wherever you saw this show. We will get back to you. And for those, again, who are still, still watching wa at this end of the game here, please like the video and support the show with a comment, share it with folks. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe and click that bell icon. Let me tell you who's coming up next. Oh my gosh, because you know, I go live at 1 p.m. on Tuesdays and on Fridays. And <laughs> a phenomenal founder. It's the Dot Red founder and visual art and tech entrepreneur, Jeremy Quant, and he's sharing his innovative art tech platform with us. So imagine everyone touring an art exhibit and having conversations with others about the artist's work, all from the comfort of your smartphone or laptop. Woohoo! I love this something fierce. Here's how you RSVP. You're going to go right over here to my meetup group, scan that QR code or hop, pop in the bit.ly link. And this way, you'll be alerted every time I go live, okay? But Jeremy's got so many great things to share. You're going to love meeting him. And really, how much fun to be able to add wind to an artist's world by gathering and having a artful conversation with others audio-wise while looking at the artwork. I just love this something fierce. So we'll see you then. In the meantime, I believe in you. I'm so grateful that you are moving forward with your business. Remember what Ethan said, no matter what, if, even if it doesn't work out, you're going to learn, you're going to apply it to the next business, but may your business continue to succeed and provide you with the fulfillment you need. And please remember always that you've got this. Cheers, everyone. See you next time. Mwah.